Good morning and welcome to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking. I'm your host, Robert Erickson, and for the next 30 minutes, you'll hear about medical issues and topics of the day directly from leading medical professionals at Southern Maine Healthcare. My guest today is Dr. Gregory Taggart, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon and fellowship-trained foot and ankle specialist at SMHC Orthopedics. Dr. Taggart is here to discuss orthopedic treatment for foot and ankle conditions. Welcome, Dr. Taggart. Well, thank you for having me. Now, as we're going to learn, you have a particularly interesting military background. But first, how did you get involved in uh, in the world of medicine? It's a uh, it's kind of a funny story. When I was in uh, in high school, my junior year in football, I I uh, hurt my knee. Uh, I got tackled and I hurt my knee. And I remember going to the emergency room, and they called in the orthopedic surgeon. And I was sitting there, and I'm, now remember, I'm a 16 year old boy with uh, certain interests in various things, and this orthopedic surgeon uh, I see drive up in a, in a uh, cherry red 911 Porsche. And he comes in, and he was dressed up all real well and acted really athletic and, and cool. And I said, you know what, that, that's what I want to be. And it's, it's kind of simple, but that's what you think about when you're 16. And, well, I don't have a Porsche, and I certainly don't dress that well. And I drive a pickup truck, but that's how I started. So how did you end up here in Maine? We've had a long uh, travel history. Um, when I first got out of uh, my residency and my fellowship, uh, we, my first job was down in New Haven, Connecticut. And I worked down uh, in a private practice group that was associated with uh, Yale. And I was there for about nine years. During that time, uh, I was uh, in the Army Reserves. And then after 9-11, I kept getting deployed. And with the deployments, when you're in private practice, it's very difficult financially to um, make ends meet. So private practice is, is, very, is very hard. So when, we, when I finished my last tour in Iraq, uh, we decided to change from uh, private practice to an academic position. So I went to UMass and uh, was the chief of the foot and ankle uh, division of the uh, Department of Orthopedics uh, at UMass. And I did that for a while trying to figure out what we were going to do. During the uh, the deployments, uh, I kind of wanted to, I felt like traveling a lot. And I remember one day we sat, my wife and I were sitting uh, at our home in Grafton, Mass, and, and, and we were sitting there saying, you know what, let's do something. Let's go somewhere. And, and she said, uh, well, where do you want to, where do you want to go? I said, I don't know, where do you want to go? And she, we looked at a map and she pointed her finger at Colorado. I said, okay, we'll move to Colorado. So we up and went worked to Colorado for a while. And then um, when we had our fifth child, we, uh, we said, uh, you know, we want to raise our kids back in New England. We were both from New England, and um, we want to have a nice small town, and uh, let's go back because our, our folks are back here. And we looked at the map again, and I said, well, Michelle grew up in Connecticut. We don't want to go back there. I grew up in Massachusetts. Don't want to go back there. There was nothing really uh, in Rhode Island that was interesting, um, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, nothing really interesting, and we looked at Maine. And there were two jobs in Maine. One was up in Bangor, and one was down here. And we, uh, I sent my wife first because, uh, obviously, she has to be happy. So I sent her with a realtor in Bangor. She looked around, and she came down to Kenny Bunkport and Saw a realtor there, and she called me and said, you're taking the job in Biddeford because we're moving to Kennebunkport. And I said, okay. So then I called the job here, sight unseen, and said, I'll work here. Well, we're glad to have you here. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the community. With five kids, uh, you're doing some coaching and other things. Tell us about that. Probably the most uh, important thing that I do, uh, at least for my uh, interests and and, uh, and my likes, is is the coaching. And my... Um, I've been coaching my uh, my son, uh, my oldest son, uh, football since he was uh, probably in fourth grade, and he's a freshman now at Kenny Bunk High School. And uh, I coached the uh, the Pee Wee team here uh, in Kenny Bunk in Kenny Bunk uh, for the past uh, well since we've been here. It was a sad day when uh, when Christopher went off to high school because my days of of having direct coaching responsibilities with him were over, and I thought that, that was a pretty sad day. My two girls are 10 and 8, and they, uh, I, I coach them softball. 
Now, my oldest decided that she wanted to play lacrosse, so she's uh, she and I are done. But my uh, youngest daughter and, and I are, are coaching. I'm coaching her uh, her uh, softball team right now. And then my little boy, who is six, I'm coaching his t-ball team, and uh, that's an awful lot of fun. And I have I have to say, I probably get. Um, I, I probably like doing that more than anything else I do. It's, it's, a, it's a sense of freedom and a sense of uh, really making a difference when, you, when you're coaching those, those young kids. Now, as I mentioned before, you've got extensive military experience. You've been in three theaters of war, Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Why don't you talk a little bit about your, your military experience? Yeah, I joined the Army in uh, 1990 as a reservist. There was a special program after the Cold War ended called the STRAP program, and there was a shortage of orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, and anesthesiologists. And there was a great program uh, from the Army where you could um, join the reserves as a resident, and you receive a stipend monthly during your residency, and you uh, owe uh, reserve time after your residency. I thought it was a great deal. I always wanted to be in the Army anyway, and so I, I joined it. And I can't, can't say enough about the Army. I had the most fun, uh, most respectable organization I've ever been in. Uh, it fits my personality well, and I think it's uh, I'm very proud to be part of the Army. My um, first experience in deployments was in Bosnia, where I, I backfilled an orthopedic surgeon out, out, in, uh, out in, uh, in Tuzla. And uh, that was, it was pretty much the end of that conflict. Uh, we didn't do a whole, we didn't do much. Uh, as, as far as surgically concerned, and, uh, but it was a, a good experience in terms of the deployment process. Got to go to Fort Benning, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. The uh, second deployment uh, was after 9-11, and I was uh, in uh, Kandahar, uh, Afghanistan, uh, with the uh, 101st uh, Airborne and then the 82nd Airborne, and that was uh, an incredibly interesting uh, experience. Those, uh, those soldiers are, are unbelievable people, and taking care of them uh, was an honor. The third deployment was to Iraq. Uh, we were in a what was called a forward surgical team, which is um, usually a mobile unit. We were not mobile. We were fixed in uh, at the airport in uh, in Baghdad, and we were we took the casualties uh, via helicopter uh, when they first were were injured. And those. Uh, we, we saw a lot of casualties in that particular deployment, and that was, that was pretty tough. Um, we took, I was the only orthopedic surgeon there, so we took care of uh, any orthopedic problems that came in. And, and with the body armor and so forth, uh, the majority of injuries were extremity injuries. So I was very busy, uh, saw some bad things. Uh, we, did some, we did some really good work with those, uh, with those kids. Again, I can't say enough for those, those soldiers. You, you'd get... You know, Twenty-year-old, um, you know, little boys really uh, who would be uh, who would be injured, and they're looking after their buddies and and uh, wanting to get back to their units, and were, were were great patients to take care of. You really wanted to do an extremely good job with them. So, what sort of effect did it have on you as an orthopedic surgeon? What what sort of injuries did you treat over there? Mostly blast injuries uh, from IEDs, and a as a forward surgical team, uh, we didn't have a lot of equipment. And m my major role was to stabilize the extremity and to clean the wounds. And we would have a helicopter come in. They'd have a leg injury, per se, with fractures. And my job uh, would be to wash out the wound. And usually I'd apply an external fixator, which is a um, type of device where you put screws into the bone above and below the fracture, and then you run a, um, a metal bar or graphite bar from those pin sites via clamps to um, do sort of an external um, splinting type thing. Uh, it's called an external fixator. And that would be the majority. And then as soon as I, would done, I was done, I would, we would call the helicopters back. They'd pick up the, uh, the soldier and bring him or her to um, a more definitive uh, um, hospital. You call it a combat support hospital. And it was in the green zone, if, if you recall. And then from there, they would go uh, usually to Germany. That must have been extremely challenging. I assume that would have tested your skill as a uh, surgeon because you don't have the uh, advances of a modern hospital there, or, or maybe you did. Oh, our, even though we were uh, mobile and, and essentially could be uh, in a tent, 
uh, I thought our our uh, our operating rooms were excellent. We had the the soldiers that were um, the uh, scrub techs and the nurses and the uh, and, uh, the nurse anesthetists. They were fantastic, as good as any civilian, better than any civilian type of hospital. Uh, our infection rate was not that high. Uh, we kept these places clean. Uh, the the sterilizers worked well. Uh, we I, I'd say it was a it was a very high quality. Um, operating room. Now, a lot of our listeners, especially our older listeners, might remember MASH, the TV show. And aside from the comedy part of that, was the, if we visualize it, was that the kind of situation that you were in? When I was there, the the quantity of casualties was less than the MASH shows. But uh, it, was, it was fairly similar. It, it just, we, we, had the, uh, we had the capability of, of doing two operations at the same time. We had enough personnel, and we had two operating room tables. We had two anesthesia machines, and we could do that. We did that a few times, but it was, I guess it was, uh, I guess it was similar. Is there any one memory maybe that sticks out in your mind that affected you emotionally? Much of it did. Uh, the, and, and I think it, it, for a while after I got back from Iraq, I, I did have a, diff, a, a slight difficult time with some things, and, and uh, probably the most important thing that I had difficulty with, which I'm, I'm now over, was the was the soldiers that you took care of in Iraq were these um, amazing individuals who sacrificed everything to to be part of this this US army and you really felt unbelievably proud and motivated to take care of these people who who wanted to just get back to their units even though they may have a very severe injury and when i came back to the civilian world i i had a slight problem with people who would come to the office who either malingering or made uh, a rather minor thing be a big deal. And I, I had a hard, hard time with empathy um, for a while. And um, I'm not saying that's, that's right, but it, it was true. That's probably the, the, the thing I had to get through uh, the most. And it, it took me a couple years, really, to be able to take people seriously that perhaps didn't have the severe injuries that I took, uh, took care of. You're listening to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking with Robert Erickson. My guest today is Dr. Gregory Taggart, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon and fellowship-trained foot and ankle specialist at SMHC Orthopedics. And we'll be right back with Dr. Taggart after this quick message. Not every boo-boo is an emergency, but it still feels like one. That's why Southern Maine Healthcare offers walk-in care. You'll find compassionate care at wonderfully convenient locations. Open seven days a week, no appointment necessary. For those times when the unexpected happens, or you're just not feeling great, look for the orange ball as your sign of the best walk-in care. In Kennebunk, Saco, Waterboro, and Sanford, Southern Maine Health Care, a member of Maine Health. And we're back with Dr. Gregory Taggart. Dr. Taggart, what kind of injuries do you see most often here in Southern Maine? Foot and ankle surgery is a broad spectrum of different conditions we take care of and a broad age range. It's from, the, uh, it's from the newborn with club feet to the very elderly uh, diabetic who perhaps you have to take care of a diabetic ulcer or special shoes. Uh, we, we take care of, uh, of traumatic things such as ankle fractures, um, a tremendous number of ankle sprains and tendonitis and flat feet to uh, more uh, arthritic conditions uh, that from either past trauma or from people who just develop arthritis. And that involves both the ankle, the arch area called the midfoot, and the forefoot, which is the toes. We take care of the standard forefoot deformities uh, uh, like bunions and hammer toes and, and neuromas and all these, uh, these things that people uh, suffer from. So the beauty of, uh, of foot and ankle is the opportunity to take care of such a broad range of types of patients and types of injuries. Now, most people in their lifetime have, I assume, have some sort of foot problem at some point. How do patients end up in your office? Do they, do they finally get to the point where they, it's pain-driven, or do they go, get referred from their primary care physician? How, how do they end up in your office? Many, I'd have to say most patients that come to the office are referrals from their primary care physicians or from the emergency room. There's a few that come in just on their own, uh, but most are from our, our, our consults. Uh, the thing that we take care of most of them, the thing we always have to pay attention to, is 
what is the dysfunction that a patient has as a result of a particular condition of the foot. What we don't try to concentrate on is the actual deformity of the foot. Many people will come in and they'll have a bunion or a crooked toe of some sort or a bump and they'll say, uh, I don't like, I don't like this, uh, what this looks like. And I'll ask the question, well, how does it affect you in either sports or regular life or wearing shoes? Well, it doesn't affect me very much. And my, my answer to that was, well, we really like what that looks like, don't we? Because we can make a crooked thing that's painless to a straight thing that might end up painful after an operation. So we have to be really careful when we, uh, when we see these patients. So it's really pain and dysfunction is the most important symptom that we would take care of. So what do you tell people if someone's having a foot problem? What, what is your recommendation? Or maybe a better question is, how can people take better care of their feet and how do you promote good foot health? It all depends on the, pa on the patient we're talking about. If we're talking about the older patient who is, uh, who, who's diabetic, self-foot care is probably the most important thing that they can do. And almost all of the conditions that the diabetic will, uh, will suffer from, as far as the foot is concerned, can be prevented with simple uh, self-care. And what, what I always recommend to patients is, first of all, they need to get a handheld mirror. And they need to look at the bottom of their feet every single day. Because when people have diabetes, frequently they lose some feeling in, their, in the bottom of their foot, so they don't exactly know what they're walking on. And they could be walking on a tack, a nail, a pebble, all day and develop these little ulcers. They can develop these uh, the calluses. And they need to see that because if you get to those things quickly, then they can be treated. If, you ignore, if they ignore them because they don't know they're there, then that's when serious problems like infections occur. So in, in older patients who have diabetes, handheld mirror is important. The second most important thing is never go barefoot except in the shower, ever. Never go barefoot. And why I say that is because, again, they can be walking on, on all kinds of things and not even know that they may have, uh, have, uh, have walked on a sharp object. The next thing is, is they need to keep their skin lubricated. And as part of the diabetic picture, the, the skin becomes somewhat uh, dried out, and you'll see cracking in the skin. And that's a good place for bacteria to enter into the body and, and cause infection. So non-alcohol-based uh, creams, such as a eucerin or a bag bomb or even Vaseline, is, is very important to maintain the lubrication of the foot. So for the older patient, that's what I recommend. For the younger patient, especially the, uh, the athlete, I get questions about uh, shoe wear. So what kind of shoes should I get because I want to be a runner or I want to be a lacrosse player? And my answer to that is always, first, don't look at the cost. Just because it costs more doesn't mean that it's better. The second thing is never think that if you put a shoe on and it doesn't fit perfectly, it'll sort of wear in or your, your, your foot will sort of be more comfortable as time goes on, what I always say is forget about what brand, forget about the cost, forget about what they say the shoe special is a specialty for, and put it on. If you walk around the store and it feels perfect the first time you put it on, then that's the shoe for you. And that's what I always tell these, uh, these, these younger athletes. Now, there was a movement recently, a trends in running, where people were running in bare feet or, you know, the shoes with the little toes in it. What's your, what's your opinion about that? I guess it depends on who you read. There, there are some, uh, there's some publications, including books. I think one of them is Born to Run or something like that. And, and the, that author is a big proponent of the um, minimal shoe wear. And what the... Um, the thought process behind that is, is is that the normal function and the biomechanics of the foot are are not allowed to do their job if you have these uh, these shoes on that give all the support and that you can do a better job with uh, with decreasing energy expenditure using the proper musculature in the barefoot or minimalist shoe as opposed to the regular shoe. I run a little bit. Um, I'm no marathon runner by any means, but I can't imagine running barefoot. I, I can't imagine anything more painful uh, or risky. So I, I'm not a big proponent of it simply because it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And if, I guess if, you walk, if you're running on a track uh, where it's, it's no chance of running on any, any dirt or rocks, but around here where there's so much sand on the side of the road, I, I just think it's just uh, 
somewhat dangerous. Now, you've mentioned some of the issues regarding um, people with diabetes, with athletes. What about the average person? What kinds of things do you see uh, should the average person be on the lookout for? And can those foot issues lead to other health issues? It's not infrequent that people will come in with a long-standing foot, foot problem and complain of back pain or hip pain or knee pain. And there's no perfect study that says, okay, if you have this particular foot problem and limp, you're going to get arthritis of a joint above it or on the other leg. There's no study that proves that. One can assume, however, that if you are limping or not walking properly, you're going to uh, overtax other joints of the body, including the, the lower back, hip, and knee of the same leg or the opposite leg. So we'll see people with other areas of pain and fixing the foot problem will solve those other problems, typically. The general medical problems as a result of foot deformities is probably uh, still the, with diabetes. And, and with uh, the conditions of diabetes uh, of the foot that can occur, including ulcerations and infections and bone infections requiring uh, amputations and that sort of thing, they certainly do have, uh, have very wide consequences with the rest of the body. Maybe tell us a little bit about the foot. Why, why is it such a special part of the body? And is, are, do you, is there anything surprising that people don't know about the foot? Well, I, it's fascinating, obviously. Uh, you, you have this little tiny structure when you think about it uh, with such a small surface area, and it has to support the entire, uh, the entire body. The other thing I find interesting is the purely human function of uh, what we call proprioception. And proprioception is a, is a term to describe the, the bil- our ability to unconsciously or subconsciously determine the position of our body in space. And if you think about it, you have this, this the, the bottom of the foot contains all these nerve endings, which send signals to the spinal cord and the brain to tell you where in space you are. Because if you think about it, when we presumably came out of the trees down in, uh, when we first came out onto the savanna, if we didn't have this proprioception and we had to look down at the surface that we walked on every step we took because we didn't have that ability to, 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 to shift our weight be dependent upon the surface we're on, we'd be looking out, we'd be eaten. By, by, the pre- by, by predators. We wouldn't be able to survive. So this, this human function is amazing. So that, that to me is, is probably the most fascinating thing about the foot. We see these, this problem occur uh, with rehabilitation of, uh, of athletes. The, the athlete's ability to do cutting maneuvers so rapidly is also part of this proprioceptive function. And when people have ankle injuries like ankle sprains, that function is diminished somewhat. And that's where the, uh, the physical therapist becomes so important in the care of, uh, of, of these athletes. Now, you are a surgeon, of course. How many patients that you see end up with surgery? As surgeons, obviously, we'd like all of them to, to need surgery. But in reality, with foot and ankle conditions, uh, a vast majority are non-surgical problems. And the different types of, of therapies that we can provide patients for many conditions, one of which, of course, is surgery. May, maybe 5% of people that come in, maybe 10% of people that come in, uh, actually, uh, I, I offer an operation. But many of them can be treated with, uh, with injections of, of certain type of uh, cortisone-type medications. Physical therapy I use all the time. Those physical therapists get people better uh, all the time. They're wa- fantastic uh, professionals. The uh, other things we can do are shoe modifications. Uh, we can have special shoes made for them. They can have orthotics or inserts made specifically for uh, a certain condition that can be placed in their shoe to make them more comfortable to unload a certain part of the foot so they're not walking on a painful area. Uh, so there are many things that can be done other than surgery on these patients. So should people, as they grow older, expect to have foot problems, or can you live a long life and pretty much avoid any type of big foot problems? I'd say most people's uh, feet and ankles uh, hold up pretty well. Uh, I don't, while we see probably more older patients than younger patients, I can't, I can't believe that um, almost every older person is going to end up with a foot problem. And getting back to the younger athletes for a second, you, you obviously do a lot of coaching. You see a lot of young athletes. What concerns you most about the foot health of the younger uh, athlete? Shoe wear sometimes is funny. Uh, people, parents sometimes forget that the child's foot is growing, and the, the cleats that they bought for them last fall may not fit them this spring, and the cleats they bought for them in the early spring may not fit them in the late spring. 
So we'll see the, some of these kids who are limping around, and the simple reason is because their cleats don't fit anymore. Uh, we see uh, uh, on, on the sidelines, especially in the football field, we see ankle sprains all the time and, and fractures. And we, we take care of them very very much like, uh, like anybody, like any trainer. In fact, the trainers do most of the work. And we'll just uh, stabilize and send them to the hospital for x-rays and then treat them as needed. We probably see more upper extremity um, problems on the football field than the lower extremity problems, actually. So what do you see as the future for foot surgery and orthopedics? Obviously, you've been doing this in the last decade, and there have been a lot of advances. What, what do you see on the horizon? The largest or most uh, interesting and most published articles these days are about total ankle replacements. Total ankle replacements, uh, just like knee replacements and hip replacements, take an arthritic condition of the ankle and replace it with a combination of metal and plastic. Try to make a more, uh, more functional uh, ankle. What we do normally with arthritic ankles is, is either brace them with an external brace or do an ankle fusion. An ankle fusion means to eliminate the joint and make the bones at the joint grow together. That works extremely well. People are able to go back to work. They're able to walk and generally are pain-free. However, some people really miss the motion uh, of, of an ankle, uh, or they may have uh, fusions of other joints around the ankle, which would make a, a very uncomfortable situation if the ankle was fused as well. In those situations, an ankle replacement uh, can be placed. The Early ankle replacements were a disaster. None of them worked. The, they all failed. The bone just didn't uh, take the, the, the metal very well. There are some new generation ankle replacements which are, are kind of making a comeback. Frequently in orthopedics, we have to uh, protect ourselves from reinventing the wheel, which sometimes we do, or something in the past failed. Somebody comes along and says, well, let's try that again, and yet again it fails. And we had that problem a bit with the early generation of these newer uh, total anchor replacements. Recently, with some advancements, they have shown some improvement. Some patients are, are getting five or more years, maybe 10 years, out of their uh, anchor replacement, which is very good. I would expect that um, by the time I retire, the anchor replacement will, will have as much success as the knee and hip uh, replacement. Are there any new procedures that you are uh, working on here at Southern Maine Healthcare? I, I'm almost at the point where uh, an ankle replacement is something to consider. I've done a course before on a, a type of ankle replacement several years back. I didn't really like it. The new ones out I'm getting more interested in and probably will will uh, will try the, that uh, particular procedure at some point in the near future. Other things we, uh, we find interesting are so-called allograft replacements. An allograft is uh, bone usually from cadaver that is um, processed in a way that you're able to implant it to replace those parts in, uh, in a living individual that, I that have been uh, damaged and, and unfixable. It's been some great results with that, and I use it uh, for different types of bone grafting procedures, but there are sometimes you take an actual complete bone and replace it, and that's something that could be, uh, could be interesting and is showing uh, improved uh, results and function. Now, if people want to find out more about you, Dr. Taggart, and Southern Maine Healthcare, or just in general finding out more about foot and ankle health, what, what do you recommend? Many times when you see patients that have complex foot and ankle problems, it's very difficult to explain in, a, in an office visit the normal mechanics and then the abnormal mechanics of their foot or ankle function that is causing their problem. And I'm sure that when, you, when patients leave the room, there are times that they, they just are unclear about what is going on with them. The American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, the society in which I belong to, is called the AOFAS.com. Uh, they uh, have an excellent uh, patient portal where you can look up your condition, and it's, it's written out very well, and it gives excellent information on almost all all of the common conditions that people have in their foot or ankle. So I'd recommend AOFAS, AOFAS as, uh, as a good site to look for various, uh, uh, more clarity in their condition. And if they want to learn more about you, I assume they can just go to smhc.org. Yes, I have not checked my 
my bio on that website, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's on that website. We've run out of time for this week. My guest today has been Dr. Gregory Taggart, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon and fellowship-trained foot and ankle specialist at SMHC Orthopedics. Dr. Taggart, thank you for sharing some time with us. No, thank you for having me. Join me next week at this time for a new guest and an enlightening discussion about health care in our communities. Brought to you exclusively by Southern Maine Healthcare, your trusted resource for health care in Southern Maine.